psychologist um, and have a practice in what's called Saddlebrook, New Jersey, which is about 10 minutes from the George or GW Bridge, as we call it. I'm going to give you a little background so it helps to make sense. I come from a New York family. I was born in Manhattan. Uh, my brother and sister were not born in Manhattan, but I was. Um, my father delivered me, who's also a doctor. Uh, and why he delivered me, who knows? I think the obstetrician didn't show up or something like that. Um, so uh, my families on both sides, my mother and my father's side are New York families. Uh, my father's side is from a Queens family. My mother's side was a Manhattan family. So I was inundated with New York City from the youngest age uh, and all parts of New York City. My father, uh, who plays guitar, would often take me down uh, and my brother and my sister, we go down to Greenwich Village and he would start playing his little, uh, they call it like a Jews harp and he would play it with uh, the hippies. And I'm a little boy and I didn't even know what hippies were. And, but again, you have to understand that I was, you know, I was indoctrinated into New York and my love for New York. And as I grew up and I was in high school and had friends, uh, we would often go, go to the Palisades, um, the, those cliffs along the Hudson River. And uh, as teenagers do, we would spend nights there and we would look across the Hudson River and look at New York City and say how we would love to live there someday. And I actually do live in Manhattan. I live on 86th Street, by the way. And um, we, we all talked about how someday we would love to live here. And many of us did live here and some of us uh, went other places. So that sort of shows my love for New York. And anyway, I played music as a, a medical student. I often went down to Bleecker Street and I would play my guitar and sing with, a nut, with other uh, medical friends of mine, et cetera, et cetera. So at that particular time, my wife and I had a home in uh, Montvale, New Jersey. And a uh, nice pretty little house we had. And uh, I woke up that morning and I think, I, I guess whatever day it was, I don't remember what day it was. Was it a Saturday? I don't know. Tuesday. Tuesday. Sorry. I can't remember everything. So came downstairs, put on the, um, I made my usual cup of tea and put on the boob tube as I usually do in the morning. And uh, I, I really needed to get my head around what I was watching on TV. Uh, it, it was just, I, I think everybody would tell you that it was just I've never seen anything like it. I, I've seen O.J. Simpson and I have, you know, maybe that's later on. No, that was before. Um, and I've seen some of the other pretty amazing things. I saw, I've seen the earthquake out in San Francisco, but in my, in my, what I consider, excuse me, my city, New York, my love for New York and what I was watching. And at that time, the first uh, World Trade Center was on fire and that's all there was. And of course it was very serious and it was on every channel. And I'm just looking at this, really couldn't get my head around what I was looking at. I couldn't even, it was hard to believe it. At some point, I guess the second um, jet airplane hit the second building. And I don't remember exactly how it happened, what, what the sequences were. But at some point as I'm watching the tube, I don't remember if I woke up my wife or not, at that point, I guess I probably did. Maybe I didn't because I was so, I was so, it was so unbelievable. That's all I remember is the next thing I know, I, I saw one of the buildings fall down and it, it was just probably the most unbelievable mind blowing thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, just to let you know, as, as a doctor, I'm a dermatologist. I did my training as an AIDS physician in, at 1990. In 1990, when uh, they knew nothing about AIDS, all you had was AZT and two other medicines, and that was it. And it was all men. And I worked at the AIDS hospital, and they were, this was in, in Manhattan, of course, because uh, I wanted to be an intern in Manhattan. And I saw a lot of men die. And that, and that, and that was incredible. 
and and that I survived being a doctor, an AIDS physician, as an intern, what was very meaningful to me. But it was nothing like what I was watching on my TV set as I saw that first uh, World Trade Center go down and and seeing that second jet airplane go into the other building. So I can't explain, it's hard to explain my feelings except that it was, an, it was just unbelievable. And very early on, I knew I had to do something. I had to be there. I mean, New York is my love and I had to do something. I didn't know, I didn't know what was going on there. I just knew I had to go there and, and help. It was an inner feeling. I think a lot of people knew not to go there. But the first thought I had is I had to get there. And I guess I somehow or another conjured my wife, who's a nurse, by the way, and we hopped in our car. So again, we're living in New Jersey at the time, and I spent at least half my time living in Manhattan. Uh, but this was Jersey at the time, and uh, the GW Bridge was open, and uh, that sort of surprised me. And we had a little parking spot in, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, because that's how, that's how much time we spend in New York, my wife and I. Uh, we even had our own little parking spot because we would go there and we'd go to the village, we'd go to the Lower East Side, we'd go to the Upper East Side, West Side, uh, museums, whatever. So we even had our own little parking. So we, we pulled into the parking and to the best of my memory, I think we got on a train that I think took us down to about 59th Street. Uh, we both brought our insignias. My wife had a, a, a registered nurse insignia and I had my doctor insignia. Uh, I, I can't really remember what it was like on the Upper East Side at that time, but I think there was some normality going on there because this was just so hard to comprehend what was really happening. And you could just see down downtown this just plume uh, of smoke as I essentially the second building had went down. So uh, we get off at 90 at uh, 59th Street and we had to walk down. And I have pictures of this. I have a, uh, one of my medical st students actually wrote a book because um, I had written a, a whole story about what had happened. And I have little pictures of what had happened, uh, my experience. And my one of my medical students about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, turned it into a little book that I leave in my office for my patients to read. I don't think they really read it anymore. It's so long ago. It's amazing to think that it's 20 years. So as we're walking down, I think we get to 33rd Street. I know Manhattan very well. And there was just a huge crowd of people. And on the walls, I think it was a church. I can't, it's hard for me to remember. I don't remember why everybody was there, but they were pictures. I called it the, the wall of lost souls. And it was just hundreds and hundreds, maybe over a thousand people putting up pictures of people they couldn't find, their husbands, their wives, their children, their friends, uh, people that people live with, whatever, as New York is, everything. And it was just, and I took pictures of this, uh, just this massive wall of pictures of people missing on, on 33rd Street. So uh, I can, we continue to make our way down, my wife and I, as we got closer and closer, it, it was getting harder and harder to get down there. We were pretty easily, to, we made it down to um, Washington Square Park. And I took a couple of pictures there and Greenwich Village was like I'd never seen before. There was nobody. Washington Square Park was empty. There was not a soul anywhere. And uh, I wrote in my book that I had never seen Greenwich Village like that in my life. We continued down the Houston Street. Uh, at that point, the military was there and they wouldn't let anybody go further. And I was obsessed with getting there, obsessed with doing whatever I could. 
I had heard on the radio, I think in my car as we were driving over the bridge to our parking spot that if you were a doctor or a healthcare worker and wanted to be involved and help, you would go to the Jacob Javits Center and you could register and they would assign you where to go. Well, um, I've never been that way. I'm, I'm always, you know, I have my own practice. I practice on my own. I'm sort of my own man and I just don't listen to anybody. I wanted to get there. I wasn't gonna have anybody tell me how to get there. I needed to be there and I needed to do whatever I could do. So uh, we get down to Houston Street in the military. They're not letting anybody through. And I said to my wife, I said, we're gonna get through. But I'm going to find a way. And I was almost making it up to her to try to keep her and keep up, keep myself elevated in, in my, my obsession to be there. And suddenly, somewhere about after a half hour of, of just sort of mulling this over, this little truck goes by that's carrying people down to help out. I guess they were rescue workers. I don't know what they were, people, whatever. I don't know what they were, they were specialists. And I stopped the truck and showed them my ID and I said, can I go? And they said, yeah, hop on the back of the truck. So I hop on the back of this truck and my wife decides, hey, listen, I'm not gonna go. I think I'm gonna go back. So we hugged, we kissed and uh, she, she went back to the Upper East Side and I continued and I hopped on the back of this pickup truck or whatever it was. I'm barely holding on. And we go through the military checkpoint. They had their rifles and their machine guns or whatever. And uh, I have pictures of that also. And uh, as they, we get closer and closer downtown, and I haven't been downtown as much, usually the village uh, Lower East Side, uh, Soho were the areas I knew best. Uh, way down, you know, on the south portion of Manhattan was not the area I knew best. But suddenly it got very dark out and I thought it was nighttime. I figured, now again, um, you know, this is, I guess, September. It's still pretty light out. We had daylight savings, but something in my mind said, it's a nighttime. And I didn't realize really until maybe a month later or weeks later, maybe when I was writing my book, that the reason it was nighttime is because of the plume of the buildings falling had blocked out the sun and it was pitch black out. And so I, I attributed that I thought it was night and I, I, they, they dropped me off and I ran some soldiers stopped me. I showed them my ID and I said, I'm, I'm medical, I need to help out. And so I made my way through and the first thing I saw was that large piece of the World Trade Center. It's actually still there. I couldn't, I couldn't believe they left that piece there sticking out of the ground. Uh, if you've been to the site where they had that large piece of it sticking in there, I remember that very, very well and looking at it. Uh, there were, I don't know how to describe it, but there were a lot of people not alive and covered up everywhere. Uh, there were lots of dazed people and there were lots of people there who were looking for survivors, which is what I tried to eventually do was to help survivors, but it turned out I did something very different. So, Again, it was a little crazy there. One of the things I remember about being there was that a McDonald's truck shows up. And McDonald's, you know, hey, listen, McDonald's is McDonald's. This truck starts handing out free food to everybody. And I remember looking over and I'm thinking to myself, gee, that's sort of nice in McDonald's. So I didn't really know my way. I couldn't see, it was blackout. I have pictures of destroyed automobiles. I don't think I have any pictures of the World Trade Center sticking out of the ground. I certainly did not take any pictures of anybody who lost their life. I, that was not 
what I would that I couldn't. Uh, that's not what I do, and I was not going to be involved with doing that. But somehow or another, I was directed to the Stuy I made my way to the Stuyvesant School, the Stuyvesant High School, which again, I did not know about. I just made my way there. And it's hard for me to remember exactly the sequence of events, but at one point, the Stuyvesant School, as I remember, I don't know if it's normal or if it was just because of the disaster, it was right on the Hudson River. And they had these doors open and you could see the waters of the Hudson River right up to the, right up to the Stuyvesant doors that open up on the um, west side, no, the, yeah, the west side of the school. And there were boats coming in, uh, bringing in all kinds of supplies, food, whatever, bandages, all kinds of medical um, things. And, and anyway, so at some point, I think I wanted to get a little something to eat. I went upstairs in the Stuyvesant School and there were eight doctors. And what we did is we put together a like sort of triage mash unit there, or whatever you want to call a triage unit. And I remember the eight doctors and we sat down, we all talked about how we made our way there because none of us had made our way there through the Jacob Javits Center. Each one of us had done whatever we did to get there. So we had a little bite and then I, we, I went back downstairs. I don't remember what room it was in the Stuyvesant School, but I said it, we started setting it up as a triage. I had pictures of it. And I set up, since I'm, uh, since I'm a specialist in skin now, I set up a, what was called, I, I, I put up a sign, it was called um, Derm Lax, like Dermatology Laceration Center, because there were no survivors. Uh, I, I realized that I was not going to be able to save anybody. There were none. So I still had a job to do, and that was to help the rescue workers. They were getting lacerations. They were getting whacked in, in areas of their body. They were bleeding. Uh, a lot of people were hurt. And a lot of these people out in this black gloom of pieces of buildings sticking out and covered up white she I don't know. I don't remember what it was, sheets. I, I didn't even look to see what it was. I, I just couldn't. Uh, there's a picture of me somebody took um, I have a mask on. I don't know how I got the mask. I don't remember how I got that, but somehow or another, somebody told me to put on a mask. And today I do have a lot of pulmonary problems. So in this triage center, rescue workers would come in where they were directed there. And some had um, like bullets, or what we call blistering lesions on their feet. I remember one young girl, she was probably about 18. She was like, she worked with ambulances and stuff and she had this huge laceration. And I had all this stuff that had been brought over to the school, uh, suture equipment, uh, gauze wraps, uh, ointments, bacitracin, all the, you know, everything that um, an emergency dermatological physician would want. Uh, the other doctors who were there, they were specialists in everything from psychiatry to, um, I can't remember, but I, I know I was the only skin doctor. And I spent many hours helping out people, wrapping up people. Sometimes I would be just sitting there and there would be nobody. And I would go out and take a walk around and, and it was just pitch black. And you couldn't really understand what was happening because it was just so dark. And, and again, there was just this huge piece of World Trade Center just sticking out and I'm looking at it. And so again, realizing what's going on here. I can't remember how many hours I was there. 12, 24, somewhere around that period of time. So I can't, I'm trying to think of really anything interesting except I was helping people. Oh, I, um, 
one of the uh, stars of the, so I'm working there, one of the stars of The Sopranos, you know, are you familiar with the uh, television? So, uh, one of the star, uh, top stars of The Sopranos just happened to be standing right with me. And we were talking for a while and, and they were taking down names um, for future uh, tragedies in Manhattan and they were taking down um, emails and I, I was in line to give it. And then uh, this star from me, he was right next to me and we were talking. Very nice gentleman, by the way. So um, it was Michael and Pirelli, by the way. Nice man, nice man. So I continued on. And I guess the best way to describe it is, I just can't remember much more, but I'll give you what the, the end of the story, what happened. Uh, I'm just helping people and sometimes I wasn't. And again, patching up people uh, skin wise because that's what I do. If it was anything more than that, if it was difficulty breathing, chest pain or somebody who had fell off the building or jumped off the building that was way out of my league and they weren't alive anyway. So the only people I was helping were the rescue workers, as I said. Somewhere along the line, they, they called all the medical people, uh, nurses who were there, doctors, people like me, other people who were helping out. And we met in a large room and the military showed up. And the military, somebody representing the military said, we are bringing in our people, like a mass unit or whatever, I don't know what they would call it. And we're going to take over the medical situation here. You've done your job, congratulations. Time for you to go home. That's, I was able to get a phone. It actually worked. I don't know why it worked because you have to remember there was nobody had cell phones or very few people had cell phones back then. And I was able to get on a main line somehow or another, I was able to contact my wife and inform her that at some point I, I, I would be back and meet her at the garage. So it was time to go. And again, it's this black grossness of, of you couldn't see, and it starts to rain. And between the rain and, and, and the blackness of it all, uh, and again, I don't even know what time it was anymore. It could have been nighttime. It could have been morning. It didn't make a difference. You couldn't see. I really was at a loss at how I'm going to get back to the Upper East Side. And I saw a bus, a small little bus of policemen, New York cops. And I knocked on their door and I said, can you give me a ride? And they said, yeah, come on in. And they gave me a ride up to about 59th Street, somewhere around there, maybe a little 50th Street, I don't remember exactly. And I thanked them, I guess they went to their precinct and they dropped me off. But I still had about 40 blocks to go up to the east side. So I'm sort of, it's rain is coming down, it's disgusting out. Uh, I'm exhausted, just exhausted from the emotional side of it. It, it, you know, as time goes on and you're taking care of these people and you see this big hunk of World Trade Center sticking out of the ground, it sinks in more and more of what's going on. And it was becoming harder and harder for me to do it anyway. Not because of the physical side. I was fairly young then. I was 20 years younger. But it was just difficult uh, mentally. I was really, it was hard for me to do it. I realized it. It was, I'm glad the military showed up. It was time for me to go. So a cabbie pulls over, sees me and picks me up and says, do you need a ride? And I said, yes, I do. I need to get up town to uh, my garage. And he goes, oh, don't worry about it. I'm not going to charge you. You know, please give me halfway ride there. And then a cabbie doesn't even charge me. He knew that I was a doctor and uh, he gave me a ride all the way up to the east side. And there, it, it was a little building. It had a little like doorman area. And my wife was, it was, I, all I know is it, it was dark out when I met her up there. And she was sleeping in the little 
four man area. And I was exhausted and she drove me home. And it stuck with me ever since. Uh, I have the story that I wrote, which is pretty much the one you heard. And it was turned into a little book, not published or anything, just it was made into a book for my patients to read. Uh, in April of 2002, one of our uh, physicians journal, uh, physician journal uh, had done an article on doctors and the article started, it was about me, but it was about other doctors and what, and actually two of the other doctors I knew, I didn't even know they were part of the whole thing, but they were doing their, their thing. So I didn't had, had any way of knowing they were there. And um, I believe that's my story. You suffer health effects from that. You, you didn't go back down there. That was the only time you were at the World Trade I, Center area? I, I didn't go down for 18 years. I couldn't go back there. Wow. Uh, maybe about two years ago, <coughs> excuse me, my wife and I went down there. And I couldn't believe it. That big piece of World Trade Center was still stuck in the ground, sticking up. I couldn't believe it. I said, that's it. I remember that. Uh, it was hard for me to get my, to know where I was or where the Stuyvesant High School was in, in relationship to the, um, uh, the uh, World Trade Center. So uh, no, it took me 18 years. I, I didn't want to go back. And I do love New York and I live in New York now for many, many years. So even though you spent just hours there, you still suffered health effects. I was there at least 12 hours, maybe up to 24. I, I just lost track of time. Uh, I would say it was not much longer than that. That was, and it, it, the army came, they kicked us out. And what sort uh, but, of health effects do you have? Um, so t about two years ago, uh, my pulmonologist, I have uh, a long, long history of asthma since I was a child. I've been in the hospital uh, about three, about four times, four or five times I've been admitted. And two stories with that. First story is, uh, I think 2017, maybe it was, yeah, yeah, 17. Uh, I woke up, I'm living in Manhattan and I had picked up a little flu and I couldn't breathe. I was suffocating to death. I was actually suffocating in front of my wife. It just hit me out of nowhere. In fact, that night I had taken a little swim. I had been swimming regularly I think that probably saved my life doing that swimming. And my wife called 911 and uh, they came within minutes, uh, three, with under five minutes they were there. And they took me to Mount Sinai and I was intubated. That was the first time I'd, I'd been intubated and I was put up on their ICU. So the idea is my lungs are not were not getting good. They were getting worse and worse over the years. Uh, and I met with my pulmonologist. Uh, I survived that. Mount Sinai saved my life. I'm also on staff at Mount Sinai, by the way. So my pulmonologist, who is was a friend of mine, uh, if you imagine me in my 50s and he's in his mid-70s, uh, he died, him and his wife died from the COVID virus um, in March last year. And that, 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 that's a whole nother story. So anyway, he had told me two years ago that your pulmonary function is so poor that you can go on disability. You know, now I'm, I'm in my later 50s. And I explained to him, I said, there's just no way I want to go on disability in my late 50s. You know? But he was very clear that my pulmonary function had taken, something had really 
uh, really hurt it. And um, it just so happened this pulmonologist who passed away from COVID had a brother who practices with him who was also a pulmonologist. So now the brother sees me and basically my pulmonary uh, ability function is uh, staying stable with treatment right now. Uh, I can become short of breath very easily. Uh, the COVID virus was very scary for me. I knew that if I'd gotten the virus, I would die because my pulmonary function was so poor. But I was able to get, since I'm a doctor, I was able to get immunized. Uh, and yes, I, I've been severely, I don't know what else would have, I don't think asthma. He told me, you know, you have asthma and yes, you do have some damage from, from years of asthma, but that's what I'm told. I, I can go on disability. Well, severe respiratory illnesses are, are some of the illnesses that people got as a result of exposure to the toxic dust down there. And like I said, even though you were there for 12, 24 hours, that was enough exposure where it's scientifically linked to the dust. Well, it was pitch black. It was pitch black. I didn't even realize what, 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 why it was pitch black. I thought it was nighttime. It wasn't nighttime. It, I was down there in the evening. Uh, I think I got down there at about five o'clock. So September, five o'clock, I'm sure it was still some light out, but it was nighttime. So I'm breathing in whatever I'm breathing in, this plume of you know, horrible. A lot of people suffered. I'm still alive. And going back to my pulmonary function, I feel it. And it's very difficult. Not, I don't feel it if I'm treating my patients or if I'm sitting here talking with you, but uh, I love to get around New York and walk up Carnegie Hill and through the parks and, and I get out of breath now. And it's just part of dealing with your life, I guess. And I attributed, you know, to being, okay, I'm a little, you know, I'm only 60, you know, or 59 at this point. But it sort of came together that I don't think when my first pulmonologist said that you were ready for disability, I don't think we made the connection. He, he just figured I had lousy asthma and was intubated and, and in bad shape. But suddenly for the first time, not you know, within a year or two, I, I, why am I so bad? Why am I worse than everybody else? And I realized what has to be the reason. Do you have any regrets as a result? No, no, I, I would, I'm proud of myself. And there were people in my family. Uh, I come from a doctor family. I'm the only one who did anything like this in my family who told me what I did was reckless and they weren't necessarily thought that, you know, they were proud or I was a hero or anything. Not that I did it. I did it because I love the city. And um, to hear my own family sort of put me down for my recklessness over the many years is it's very painful to me because I'm proud of what I did. I loved New York. It, it's in me. It's my life. It's it's my family. My family's from here. Both sides of my family. One side of my family was was this wealthy uh, Manhattan, Riverside Drive, beautiful apartments. My mother pictures. I have pictures of my mother when she was four years old with her little cousins all walking around Central Park. As I grew up, I went to Queens all the time to visit my father's side of the family, which all came from Flushing. I'm a New Yorker. I was born here. My, my, my siblings weren't born here. They were born in New Jersey and they're older than me. 
I'm young, I'm the youngest. And I, I, I was born right on the Upper East Side at, a, at a, the hospital's not there anymore. It's called Leroy Hospital. It was a very, very fancy hospital. Liza Minnelli and, well, excuse me, sorry. A little bit of a cold, but anyway, I uh, apologize. But anyway, so um, New York has been my life. I love it. Uh, there's a lot of changes in New York that I'm not happy with, but I still love the place and I'm still proud of what I did. Is there anything else you want to add, doctor? Probably after we hang up, <laughs> you know. Um, I did what I needed to do. And uh, if I have to suffer and I do, I did what I had to do. It's not the first time I've been done things like this. I told you uh, 10 years before that, I spent a year working with HIV patients at a time where there were no cures. There, were, there was no Magic Johnson back then. It was just men, young, a lot of young men I watched die. And uh, I had to do that. And I did it for two reasons. One was because I had to, I was felt I had to do this. And the second reason I did it as a young doctor is I felt that if I can make it and work with these men, it was mostly men, by the way, I don't remember any women at all that if I could get through this, it would make me a better person, a better doctor. And it did it made me a much better doctor. Um, I'm very, I care about my patients. My patients know that I'm very, I can't think of the word, uh, empathic with my patients. If there's pain and, and being dermatologist, when I'm not talking about doing tummy tucks, that's not what I do. I don't, that's not what I do. I, I, that, that's the last thing I would want to do. I'm a doctor. I take cancer off. Uh, I, I take care of babies with crazy rashes and take care of teenagers with acne. And I know that sounds like no big deal, but if you're a teenager and you've had acne, trust me, I got to tell you, it's the worst thing in the world. And I can see it in these young, you know, 10, 12, 14 year olds. I can see the, the desperation. And I remember being that young and, and knowing how you looked in high school, how, you know, how important that was. And, and though these things have helped me and my patients know, and I have, I've always had a good practice. I've always had a good reputation in my area for being that kind of a doctor. And there's less and less of us. Well, I thank you for sharing your story and I thank you for all you have done, doctor. It's been an honor speaking with you. Thank you very much.